welcome to another episode of Shooting the Shit with Rachel Ann and Neil Young. We're talking all things real estate photography business, business growth, mindset, and getting it done. Here come your favorite true entrepreneurs, Rachel Ann and Neil Young, shooting the shit. I have a ferret on the podcast. Like if we're kind of in a slump, like what kind of things do you do? He's talking like about a boob light. Straddling a power line. Nice like, photo. Okay. And I, Ooh, I need that. <laughs> I'm like red right now because I'm embarrassed. I go like this. I love it. Hey, come in, come in. Sure. Use your podcast voice. Well, <laughs> you know, over here, I'm pitting out. Drone's like <laughs> flipping to the ground. That's a great callback. <laughs> Chit chat. Is that what you call that? Hey. Hey. Rachel. Neil, are you I'm okay? Just, I'm just gonna. <laughs> I'm just going to let my microphone hold me up tonight. Is that fine? Wake up, Neil. Wake huh? up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. <laughs> I'm so tired. Hello. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Shooting the Shit. Neil is falling asleep on the podcast today. He had a long day, and he hasn't told uh, me what has happened yet, but oh, he's going to. Well, it was, it was a long day shooting, uh, and I'm just tired from that. But the other day, this is, I think, the other half of it is I went with my daughter to the fun city which is one of those trampoline parks mm. oh yeah and an hour and a half oh yeah she's like <laughs> you're gonna do it with me daddy right i'm like yeah i'm doing it with you hour and a half muscles i have not used oh that oh. that is a workout if you Isn't had it? that if you had that in your basement you would be in perfect shape oh, seriously goodness. and they have like ninja warrior obstacle courses set up everywhere mm -hmm. and of course the kids mm -hmm. want to do those it's like Oh gosh, doing the rings or like the bars? Yeah, impossible. I was doing this, so hard. These metal rings that go across like a pole, but the pole doesn't go straight across. It goes like up and down and up and down. So you kind of got to like swing and lift them oh. over those things with all, and like oh my lit up my abs. I'm like, oh, I haven't used those <laughs> muscles in a while. Oh boy. And I'm like, somebody's like, you almost made it. I'm like, I know, that's impossible. <laughs> and I love it. Kids are so like encouraging and accepting of everything that you do, right? They're just cheering yep. you on. Oh but today we have an exciting episode for you guys. So I put out a post on Instagram last night, which we're about two or three weeks behind. So you guys won't remember it, but uh, asking for topics for episodes from you guys. Like we love hearing your input and what you guys want to see more of. And we had a pretty good response. And one of the photographers asked us, I don't know, four questions that were pretty great. And it, it reminded me of the segment that we did, Ask the Boss, She's the Boss. Yep. But for this segment, we're going to call it questions from you. So we'll encourage you to keep sending us in questions and we will add them to our show notes and we'll just start answering some questions you guys have. And maybe we'll do them every four or five episodes or something. So it's more like ask the bosses because Neil's <laughs> also a boss. He's now got a team. He's doing social media stuff. Like he's doing a lot of really cool stuff. You guys, I'm so proud of his growth and can't wait to see more. But so it's not just the boss, it's the boss sis. So, oh, I'm on. blushing. If I weren't ghostly white, I could blush. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Summer is coming, my friend. Summer is coming. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, yeah, awesome. Right. No, it's so cool. We got great questions. I love getting questions from you guys. So it's really cool. So yeah, should we just dive into the questions we got? Yes. So Tiffany with Turnkey Photographic from Northeast Ohio uh, wrote us these questions on uh, a comment that she wrote. Uh, she does photo, video, drone, and Matterport, and she offers same day delivery, which is crazy. How are you doing that? Are you editing your own photos? So I'd, I'd love to hear from you. So if you want to follow her on Instagram, it's uh, Turnkey Photographic. So follow her. She's got some good stuff going on. The first question from Tiffany is that she shoots HDR and her clients expect HDR, but she wants to start shooting flambient. Is it worth the switch? And I think she's kind of asking too, like, how do I tell my clients that I shoot flambient when they expect HDR? So my first answer to this is that flambient technically is HDR. You're still do. I know there's different methods to flambient. Some people just do one ambient shot and one flash shot. However, I do a full range of HDR ambient shots, and then mm -hmm. I add that flash shot in. Yep. And so technically it's still HDR. HDR is just stands for high dynamic range, and it's the blending of multiple images to get a photo where all your highlights and all your shadows are you know, exposed properly. So you can explain yeah. it to your clients that way, and then let them know that by adding this flash, 
we're using that it one it makes the images sharper in editing and two it helps with color correction so you can explain to them like oh i started just adding a flash in because it's going to up the quality of your photos uh you know we use it for color correction and you know if there's a blue wall if we pop the flash that gives the editors a source to see the actual true color of that wall so and i tell my clients that all the time like i kind of explain my process and what i'm doing and and they love it <laughs> Yeah, no, I and I sorry, I laugh because your ferret just like popped oh, up from behind you for a me. second and took off again. <laughs> I just like, oh, later I'm on the podcast. I, I'm not prepared. I feel so bad. She's been, I haven't seen her for like two days, like all day today and all day yesterday. I didn't see her. And I go, Abel, I can't, I don't know where her socks is. And he goes, You locked her in her cage like two nights ago. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I just left her in there. <laughs> I was like, Didn't even think to get check her cage. Oh like she gosh. has food all the time. So she's fine. I'm a yeah. terrible, terrible ferret mom. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, so sorry to take us off on a tangent, but I had to call that out because I just laughed randomly for no reason in your face while you're explaining. Yes, but, no, um, you're fine. Uh, and now she's no, so oh, she's running, running amok now. Hold on. <laughs> she gets in the crack of my couch and lays oh, upside just... down and scratches the pillow. There she is. <laughs> Look at her. You're she's on YouTube. now popping up behind your she's shoulder. Like, it's hilarious. She's so cute. I love it. So funny. Hi, Sox. <laughs> Okay, enough of the ferret. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh my God, I love that. As soon as you sat down, it was like, boop, boop. <laughs> um, Yeah, so, well, back to the, the question about HDR. So it's a really valid question. Is it worth it to do this switch? And it's a question that I asked myself because originally I basically, I did, I didn't do, HDR has this stigma to it when, it for, when people first started doing it, that they did it like, they didn't do it in a great way where it looked really fake and artificial. Well, yeah, and that but, was the post-processing. There's a right, HDR right. setting that you mm -hmm. can crank up and it makes everything look almost like cartoon-like. And that's what people were associating the word HDR with, where in reality, it just means high dynamic range. So it's getting all of your, all of your ranges of your exposure no. exposed properly. So educating your clients is a huge thing, right? Yeah, so if you're, you know, the big difference there is is going to be in post processing. If you're you're doing the right things with bracketing, you and you have uh, an editor who knows what to do to make it look right, they might look fantastic. Um, but the biggest advantage with doing the flash ambient is in tricky scenarios where there's mixtures of different colors of light happening from the exterior light to the interior light and and all kinds of stuff, or maybe things that are bouncing in from the outside, like one person on the podcast mentioned you know, the color from the pool bouncing in through the windows of mm. casting weird colors. There's a lot of things that can happen. And basically the flash shot is just like Rachel said, to get the right color. So you're kind of overpowering all the light and just making the flash your dominant um, uh, color in the room to, to get the right colors basically. But so, you know, I, but I've asked this question myself a lot because I started out doing a version of HDR. I just would do um, a couple shots um and i would hand blend in where i needed the the uh, other exposures um but if i could get away with a single exposure i i wouldn't a lot of times those look awesome and you know a lot of architectural photographers are trying to use as much last uh, natural as they can when they can get away with it but um i guess i guess the trade-off is going to be in your workflow you're doing same day delivery and i'm guessing it's technically a little bit easier editing those photos if you're doing it yourself or giving them to somebody else. I think it's a little faster than editing the flash shots in as well. It can get a little tricky and a little messy depending how good your flash exposure comes out, especially if you're doing it yourself. I used to struggle with it. Now that I send my photos out, there's I don't have to deal with it. So it's not I'm like, it's great. I don't have to really focus as much on making sure I get the the flash stuff perfect and they they can kind of they can do uh, a lot with it and i get great photos all the time and i can make sure that the colors are accurate that's the biggest thing but yeah but if i had to start all over again would i stick with hdr and just get a good editor who's really good at editing hdr and fly through a house in half the time and have my editing costs be less um maybe i don't know it's tricky to say i don't know i've yeah, definitely so got good quality but it's a question mark Upmarket Media, they have their podcast, Upmarket mm -hmm. Podcast. They're fantastic. They do HDR only, and they have really good editors that are trained. And I mean, their photos look fantastic. I like mm -hmm. asked them, I'm like, can I have your editor's name? They're like, haha, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
that's always like our our secret, right? You don't want to give away your editor because you don't want him mm-hmm. to get too busy to handle your workload. Uh, but yeah, for me, I was shooting Flamiant in the beginning. I always have, and then I quit. I, st- I did a couple jobs where I like forgot my flash or something, and I noticed the editor did great. I couldn't tell a difference, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And so I messaged him and said, hey, I'm just going to shoot HDR. I'm not going to do the flash. And he was like, that's fine. So I did that for about six months and it really did speed up my workflow. And then there was a house with colored walls and the photos came back with the wrong color. And that's when he said, hey, I really need you to add that flash back in because Mm -hmm. of the color correction. And I was like, "Okay." so if I have a house, it's all white walls and there's not very much color in the home. I'll just do HDR. He can handle it. No problem. But it's like when you have those blue cabinets or the big green wall or something, you just, you want to help them out. It just helps them to get that color correction. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And that's, that was going to be my answer was basically, you know, you can use that flash in a pinch whenever you need it. You don't have to use it all the time because maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe 90% of the time you can get away with just the standard um, bracketing shots. And then when you get in one of those tricky rooms or the log cabin or whatever, where the colors are crazy, then, you know, you can overpower and just use the flash as the dominant uh, light in the room to get the right colors when you need it. So just use it when you need it, maybe. Exactly. Um, So I would say, number one, educate your clients. Uh, Number two, do what you want to do. Do you, girl. Like, don't let your clients determine how you shoot because you are the pro. So as long as you are talking to them with confidence and letting them know like, hey, this is why I'm doing it and you explain the process, they're not gonna question what you're doing. Most of them really don't care how you do it as long as you deliver a good product. So um, yeah, I just, (laughs) I don't even know if I should go into this conversation, but I just started (laughs) using the Osmo 5 for my interior videos and I use my Mm -hmm. cell phone. And I think we just talked about this recently, but. I am still self-conscious going to a shoot with the brokers there and pulling out my phone and an Osmo. I just feel Mm -hmm. unprofessional. Like I have to have the big gear, but honestly, it's easier on my body. It doesn't hurt me as bad. And the quality is darn near the same, if not better. So I just have to explain that to my clients and let them know like, if they no one's even asked i always defend myself i'm like oh yeah i have problems with my neck and problems with my arm and that that (laughs) big gimbal is just killing me so i've switched to this and it's just as good you won't notice the difference and they're like okay whatever so they don't care yeah anyways so own it you just gotta own it educate them and yeah it's my advice and then the second part of their question was if we if they were going to do flash what would we recommend for Mm. a flash right and she also has a second question that relates that will continue on, but it's kind of trying to keep her kit light. Um, are you using still your your on camera flash ones, or are you doing like eighty two hundred well, now? I had speed lights that I used before. Um, yeah, I just switched lights. to the eighty two hundred, yep. and it's big for me. It's heavy. I have mm-hmm. I have like arthritis in my hands, so holding something that's heavy. I know it sounds stupid, but it hurts. It's like I feel it. So I'm almost tempted to go back to my little speed lights because they were just so lightweight. But I do like it because I can pump so much more light into the room. I don't have to use two of them and I don't have to lower my aperture or raise up my ISO and compromise quality. So I'm going to keep using it, but maybe I need like a lanyard to hang it from or something. Yes. And that's (laughs) that's what I did. I took a strap from some random bag that I had and I took one of those... um, you can buy them on like Amazon. It's just a little screw uh, piece that goes on into your camera so you can attach like a leash to it or something like that. Mm-hmm. So I attached one of those where you'd put your you know tripod mount or whatever. Um, uh, you can attach that to the flash. Okay. And so I hang it over my shoulder and it just hangs there. And so I just pick it up when I need it and flash oh. and then it just hangs down the rest of the time. So okay. doing that. But, yes. but if she wanted, that was, that was gonna say, I love the 8200 and there's some new versions and stuff like that. Um, but the 8200 is great because I especially love, it's got decent output on it and the the battery lasts me forever. It's got a big chunky oh, yeah. lithium battery. So I have a backup battery of that that I just keep in my bag. And I, it's like once a month that I'm like, oh, I got to switch the batteries. I swear it's like crazy how seldom I have to change that battery. So way better than dealing with triple A's. If you didn't want to go, if that was too big and bulky and you're like, I'm just going to use this flash once in a blue moon. So it's called uh, Godox makes a V863 um, and they make them for different brands. So, you know, you're looking for the S if you're Sony, that kind of thing, or the C if you're Canon. But that is a also a lithium pack, which I would recommend if I was going to go with those. I definitely wouldn't want to deal with double A's or triple A's or any of that. No. I would get the lithium ones so much better. Can I just tell you how much money I spent on batteries? 
because mm-hmm. I would fly through them. I was getting the lithium batteries, uh, which yep. just recycle faster and they last yeah. a little bit longer. Yep. They used to be $25 for a pack of like 30 of them. It went up mm-hmm. to 50 bucks. Yeah. And that's when I was like, okay, I'm just going to switch to this AD200 because it's super got it expensive. rechargeable. Yeah, I was like, that's crazy. But Yeah, and yeah. I would just get a backup battery for that, and they last so long that you just have that in your bag, and you don't got to worry about it. And it's a light little lithium thing. It lasts forever on those flashes. It's really cool. So that's what yeah. either of those options would be a good way to go. All right, yes, yeah, so the next question is, my website sucks, and clients never, ever book online. Do I actually need a website? And I think we both can say yes. Yes, 100% yes. you do. I actually just saw a post from another real estate photographer in the area, and he said, you don't need a website. It was like Instagram works. And if that works for you, great. But there are clients who are not on Instagram. So I think it's important to be diverse. And it really sets you up as a legit business when you have a nice yeah. website, something that's clear and concise that has, you know, a very strong above the fold first image, you know, that explains what you do, has your tagline to kind of draw them in. And then you want to have your portfolio, obviously a few pictures of your work. You don't need to go crazy. You have Mm -hmm. clear call to actions throughout telling them to book online or how to book. Right. And then you could host your blog on there as well, which will help with your SEO and driving Mm -hmm. yourself up the ranks in the Google search. Um, and then the about section too, is a good way for them to see a picture of you and know your story, know what you're about. Right. So I get a lot of traffic to my website and it's because I use social media and all my marketing messages. I'm like, go to LinkedIn bio to book a shoot online and it'll drive them to my website where they can see more examples of my work. So as you guys know, my Instagram page is a lot of pictures of me and, graphics and mindset there's some real estate photos on there but it's definitely not a real portfolio of what we do i mean our work's on there but it's kind of scattered through so when they go to the website that's where it's directly just real estate and lifestyle isn't another page but it's just a good way to showcase your business and when people Mm -hmm. google search they're going to want to go to a website when they look at you they're not going to want to necessarily go to a facebook page or an instagram page to check you out i mean maybe they do i don't know but I always it, it's Google search. You always, I always look for websites when I look for new businesses. I, I think that, uh, yeah, nowadays a lot of people will look at your Instagram as a portfolio, but if you're wanting to be taken seriously, you really should still have a website, if nothing else, as a professional portfolio that is just about that. You're going to look a lot better that way. Yeah, and like Rachel, yeah. you don't need a ton. Just get a few of your favorite images Less is going to be more if they're high quality, get a few on there that just go, oh, nice work. That's the reaction you want. And then you want them to book. Exactly. Um, yeah. So and, and it's and it's not a big investment these days. And it's not a lot of investment in time either. Now with like Squarespace and Wix. Yes, you're going to spend a couple hours figuring it out. But once you get it set up, you're going to look so much more professional. Um, and people people mention our website when we did the rebranding. They mentioned, oh, who did the website? It looks really good. Um, you know, so. Mm-hmm. People are looking at your website. Yeah, definitely. And I saw on her Instagram page in the bio, the link takes them directly to her order form, which is fine. At least you have some kind of online ordering system, but you have to train your clients to order online. So I think she mentioned not many people are ordering online. So that must mean that your clients are texting you or calling you and giving you the address and saying, I want this service, that service, which is fine when you're small, but the more you grow, it's just one extra thing. And it's a step where you could forget about a text later in the day or miss Mm -hmm. it and miss putting that order in. And then they're like, where are you? Like what happened? You know? So it's just a, it's, I have all of my clients now. I'm like, go on. Can you put the order in online, please? And there's a few older clients that just are not tech savvy and I'll put those orders in for them, you know, on my own. But for the most part, I'm driving everyone to my website. And I want them to go to my website because that's like my shiny, pretty website. It's like I've got a lot of like good examples of my work. It's a good place to upsell them if they start scrolling through and they're like, oh, wow, look at her drone photos. Like those look great. You know, look, oh, she does. I didn't know she did virtual staging, you know, so it's a way for me to sell to them as well. So you want to have very clear, concise, like call to actions and portfolio based photos and showcasing all your services on there. And not everybody's on social media. So a lot of people are going to Google local photographers. So you want to eventually be able to come up in that list. You're not going to be able to do that without the website. 
And a lot of people won't take you seriously if they don't see the website. They're going to see somebody else who has a website and think that they're more established than you are. Exactly. So yes, get a website that's pretty and drive people to it. Really? All right, gear. Neil, this question's for you. No, it's for both of us. <laughs> uh, she says, I don't want to lug a ton of crap around. I need to be light on my feet. What do you guys use for lighting? What tripod is your go-to? I have a heavy Manfrotto that I love, but it's clunky. So we already yeah. talked about lighting. I just bring the AD200 and a little yep. transmitter receiver thing that goes on the top of my camera. So that just fits in my camera bag. Neil, you do pretty much the same thing. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, if I only did photography, all I ever walk into a house with when I'm doing photography is the AD200 over my shoulder on the strap, um, the little trigger for that on top of my camera, my camera on a tripod. If that's all I did, that's all I would ever need, and I'd be good. I would just have, you know, backup battery, maybe a backup camera and in the back. Um, for the drone, for the uh, tripod question, um, I actually went, I, I always forget the numbers and everything, so I dragged it out of my car because I just leave it in my car all the time so I don't forget it. But um, my my tripod is Manfrotto as well. It's just the aluminum. There's some different versions. Mine's just the regular aluminum Manfrotto 290 Extra, made in Italy. <laughs> fancy, so, fancy. Yeah, and it's uh, it's the it's the little clip ones. I don't like the spinny rings. We talked about this one time in a gear yeah. episode. But I like the ones that just open and clip closed. And there's just two of those per leg, so it's dead easy to open. I only open the first. Uh, leg for most of the stuff till I get into the kitchen and need to raise up or something like that. And then my ball, my ball head is a dead easy to use one knob to tighten and, and then adjust it kind of thing. It's an older, now outdated. I don't think they sell this one anymore. It's a 484 RC2 Manfrotto ball head with a quick release plate. But you can get there's a newer version like a 486 or a 496 or who knows what. And it's like under 100 bucks for that ball head and it works fine. And I don't feel like I need anything else. I know people talk about getting all this fancy gear heads and stuff. I've never needed that. I've always been fine with this. So that's that's what I use for the tripod. And it's not super big. It's not a huge heavy man for it. I have one of those sitting right here holding my camera for the podcast. It's way heavier and I don't drag that around. It's too much. This thing's right middle of the road, not too light, not real heavy. It works good for me. Yeah. And I use a Sir Sir you? Sir you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know how you say it, but I know Tripod. exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Yeah, with the ball head as well. And mine's got like three legs that extend out. I like the twisty to pop them out. It's just what I've always had. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's not very heavy. It doesn't have to be crazy heavy, but you want one that's sturdy. You don't want to get just a cheapy one because you you want your camera to be steady and you're going to be in backyards and just get something that's quality. I think I paid 500 for my whole tripod setup. Um, 300 yep. for the tripod and then maybe 200 for the ball head or 150 or something. So it doesn't have to be crazy. I was training one of my shooters and he had a gearhead and he let me play with it. And I was like, wow, this is actually really cool. Like I get mm-hmm. why people like those. It's just a little bit of a learning curve to get, cause there's so many knobs to allow. Well, I'm to- sure when you're just off by a little bit, your axis, instead of like loosening my thing and it might get out of whack and you got to readjust everything, you just kind of go tweak, tweak, and it gets right there. So I get it, but. That's never been a thing that I'm like, I need to spend the money on that. Yeah, I'm not worried about trying to go get it. It's not something on my high priority list. As far as like, she's saying, I don't want to lug a lot of crap around. Like, I feel you. I hate when I go for a shoot and I have like all this stuff that I have to carry it in two trips. It's ridiculous. And it's heavy. Like my backpack is probably almost 50 pounds, which is crazy. Well, maybe not that much, but it's a lot. It's probably 30 pounds. Uh, So I have a big backpack that I use. I got it at the local Kenmore camera store here. Uh, it's got a lifetime warranty on the zippers because I've had issues with Amazon bags where the zippers break after a year, which is annoying. Uh, but it's got, you know, all the little compartments for all your camera bodies. And I just bring two camera bodies, uh, my wide angle lens, the 70 to 200. I do have my 24 to 70 in there as well, just in case somebody wants portraits when I'm on site. Uh, and then I have my flash, my Osmo 5. Yeah. That's it. Oh, and little clear door stoppers to prop open doors. And so oh. sticky tack and every <laughs> once in a while I'm like, oh, I got to get a door stopper. I still haven't got a door stopper yeah. every now and again. I'm like, ah, oh, door stopper, but I still don't have one. But yeah. um, yeah, I a lot of time I wish I'm like, I I could get away with using my backpack and I, I have an air two for my uh, drone, which is very compact. It would fit in a backpack pretty easily with three batteries. And that's usually what I go through on a busy day is three batteries. But I'm only doing three, maybe four shoots on a busy day. Um, uh but yeah i actually am 
terrible and I bring a ton of gear with me all of the time because I'm just like paranoid and I'm afraid to try and minimize because I'm afraid I'm going to forget something that I need, like some emergency battery or whatever. So I have way overkill. Uh, I actually use a Pelican roller case, but all the time I'm like 90% of the time I don't need this, but I have, you know, I have a couple backup microphones in there. I have a couple packs that hold one holds a microphone, one holds a, a LCD, a, a monitor, uh, because sometimes when I do headshots, I like to show people on a monitor and then I've got batteries in there for that monitor and I just leave it all in there. So when one day I have a headshot thing, it's all in there, but I feel like 90% of the time it's over Kyle and I wish I would just put it all in my backpack. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, but yeah. And then I've got the 85 in, in there. I've got a 24 to 70 in there. I've got a backup camera in there. Um, I've got my, my drone goes in the Pelican case as well. I've got like five batteries in there. I've got backup memory cards in there. I've got the blower for my sensor. I've got a rag to clean off my lens. I've got, uh, you know, too much stuff. I've got a backup battery for my Ronin S in there. You know, all that stuff. Wow. That I know. That's yeah. a big box of stuff mm -hmm. to lug around. So don't most do of that. the time, <laughs> most of the time it stays in my car though. I don't always drag it in. Okay. If I'm just, if I'm just doing uh, photos and stuff like that, I'm just taking out the camera and putting it on the tripod and go run around and take the photos. That all just stays in the car. Hmm. Um, unless I'm doing everything that they're like going to be talking on camera, then I'm just going to roll the thing in. I'm going to grab my Ronin S and I'm going to, and the drone's already in there. So I just drag that in. Yeah. Do you set up your camera before you go into the shoot or do you set up when you get inside? I set up, I set up, um, usually I'll always set up my camera on the tripod. Mm -hmm. um, before I go in. So I usually, okay. if I'm rolling in, I'll probably have the camera tripod and roll in my Pelican case. Um, and then I don't set up the, I usually switch to the Ronin S after I do stills. I like to do stills first. So mm -hmm. I kind of get the lay of the land um, yeah. and then I run, run through with the video after. But I, I'm really liking the idea of doing more and more of the phone stuff like you're doing. And that gimbal is so much smaller and so much lighter. That I have that, I actually have that in my bag too. Now in my Pelican case is the, is a, uh, the six um, mm. a little mobile um, phone gimbal yeah. as well. They're so, they're great, man. They're really great. And the, the quality comes out pretty good. It's amazing. I, and I'm using an Android. I don't even have the, you have the H, what do you have? HDR with, um, on your phone? What's the setting that I you use the, in? I have the iPhone 14 Pro and I use the ProRes. Yeah. ProRes. Yeah. yeah. And it comes out. But right. I, just I wasn't shoot. using ProRes and my editors use, I think they use Final Cut Pro or I don't know what mm -hmm. they use. They use some editing software yeah. and they said it was like downgrading the quality when they brought them in because like on my phone I could see all the detail outside and then when they'd give me the files I was like why do the windows look so blown out what's happening uh, I'm like oh you've got to send us better files and I was like okay so I did a little research and ProRes but they're giant files they take forever they take like probably longer than the files off of our cameras to upload yeah. on 1080p yeah, well, Pro, ProRes is a yeah, usually a huge file with Mm -hmm. ton of data in there that yeah you're getting a really good dynamic range and stuff like that yeah, and colors can be really great um now are you doing that are your when you're recording on your phone is that going directly to the cloud or are you saving it on your actual phone it's just you on know? my actual phone and then i just go through and delete them it tells you how many minutes left of recording that you have in prores because you're running out of space i had 125 i think when i started and i'm down to like 70 so i need to go through and delete all the interior yeah. videos but i like to pull them into CapCut or Beat Leap and kind of play with them to make fun little reels. Yeah. And cool. add them on to B roll and stuff. So I don't know. I need to just like heart my favorite clips and just keep yeah. those so it doesn't eat up all my storage. So. And I use an Android still. I still really like the Android, but I would like that ProRes sounds awesome. Uh, I use a, a Note uh, 10 currently, which actually does really nice video, but no, I don't have ProRes. I don't think there's a way to do that online. It's an older model now, but. Hmm. Um, but yeah, and one the reasons why I got that originally is because I thought I might do videos, a lot of video stuff with my phone. And what I do like about that is that I have an external, I can put a little mini um, SD card in there if I need to. So I never technically run out of storage. So. What are you saying to upsell drones with regular listings? It's a great yeah. question because yeah. that is something that I just recently trained my team on. I was like, we're going to talk about adding on services today, <laughs> how to sell it, how I sell it. Uh, do you want to explain how you sell it, Neil? And then I can explain. Yeah, how you're I mean, I don't really hard sell anything um, unless I'm at a place and they didn't put it on the listing. And I'm like, this place, are you sure you don't want drone? That's really the only time I'll do that. Or I might just 
triple check like, hey, you said you wanted these services, right? That's it, nothing else. And I'll do that aside, not in front of the, uh, make sure not to do that in front of the homeowner or whoever yes. the client is because they don't want them like thinking, oh, there's other things they could do and they're not doing it. Right. Um, but, but yeah, so when I will mention it is for me is when I think there's a need. So if you're at a, uh, a really nice property that has a lot of land, then that's an ideal time. You know, it's going to be hard to get the lay of the land if you're not up higher from a drone. So I was, if they didn't choose it when they, in ours, in my system, they, they choose what services they want and they book. They didn't choose it. I'll just double check and was like, you didn't want drone for this one, right? I don't really push it, but that'll be, sometimes that's enough. And they'll just be like, you think we need drone for this one? <laughs> and, and I'll, and I'll say, well, this one, and I'll give them the reasons why. Um, yeah. And it's not always just the land. One of the big reasons that a lot of this, this might help you too, is that a lot of people miss is elevated properties. If you've got a really long drive going up to this house and you're trying to get the front yard into the shot in the house, you're going to get nothing but, you know, land in front of the house and you're not going to get good perspective on the house. So that's mm -hmm. another good reason to say, hey, for this one, to get a really good shot of the front of the house, I'd recommend we get elevated with the drone shot, not straight up in the air, but just a little higher than we can get with the camera. It's going to look much better. Um, that's that's one of the times when I'll recommend drone, but I, I don't I don't push it hard. Yeah. I have a lot of the same selling tactics as you do, Neil. I don't hard sell it. I'm not trying to push it on them unless it's needed. If, like if I get to an equestrian property and they didn't order drone, I'm like, why are we not doing drone? Like we should be doing drone here. Maybe I said a little lighter than that, but it's mm. like, hey, what do you think about doing drone here? It would be a great way to show the property off and show all the different, you know, the paddock and where the house is. And another way I sell it too, if the house is near the city or near a a lake or the water the i'll say people. hey do you want to do drone here so we can show proximity to the city it's a great way to showcase it and i'm like we do a series of four photos at 400 feet from each corner of the house um and they're like oh yeah you think we should do that yeah i think it would really benefit the cell let's yeah. do it and they're like okay uh so that's a good way to sell it there um like neil was saying if the house is elevated and up on a hill i have a lot of clients who ask me can you just do one drone shot and i'm like how do you i mean i could but i have to go get my drone out fly it up every time i put it in the air it's a liability like it could crash so and that's what i tell my clients i say we don't offer just one drone shot you have to order the whole thing just because every time i put it in the air it's a liability and they're like oh okay that makes sense so yeah. and then in that case they'll order the whole thing most of the time yeah so yeah it's been my number one selling service uh, yeah behind stills it, obviously but yeah that and floor plans are the mm -hmm. biggest sellers for add-on stuff for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and another thing too is I'll, I'll ask sometimes if it's a big property and they didn't say drone, and I just double check, are there any like cool features on that on that property that we wouldn't see, you know, because there might be like a pond back there or something and they're like, oh yeah, there is that pond. Maybe we should get a drone shot. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I Most do of the times there, the agent is interested in doing it if it makes sense. Right. You know, and they're right. going to trust your guidance. Yes, exactly. That's what I was going to say. You want to really lead them in the right direction. You don't just want to sell them to sell them to make money. Like if it's necessary, encourage it. If, if there's nothing to show, discourage it. Like I had a client who booked me and it was just a regular old rambler on a little lot with nothing. I mean, it was in suburbs. There was no city. There was no lake. There was nothing. And I was like, Hey, well, um, can I ask why you ordered drone on this one? Like, is there a specific reason why you wanted us to do the drone? Mm -hmm. And she was like, Oh, no, do you think we need it? And I was like, honestly, no, unless you just want to show the lot size. Cause I do that straight down shot to show the lot. Yeah. And then we draw the line around. I'm like, you know, that's a good way to show that. But yeah. you know, if there, I t tell them if there was like a lake close or the city or a park that you wanted to show or a big property, it makes sense. But I mean, it's up to you at this, that's kind of just how I preface it. So, and that way you too, you're building trust with your clients when you're honest exactly. with them. And it's like, it's not about the money. It's about taking care of our people. Like we want our clients to be happy. We want them to do in the right thing. And if I can save them a little money on providing, you know, like taking away a service that they don't need, they'll appreciate that and come back to you just because of that trust. Yeah. A lot of times I'll get asked that, do you think we need drone for this? And a lot of times I say no. Because I'll say, how big is the lot? Is the first thing I'm going to say. Ah, it's, a, it's, you know, quarter of an acre. Eh, we don't really need it for a lot. We're probably going to see everything from the ground photos. So we probably don't need it for that. But so long as, is there anything in the vicinity that we want to show off? Is there something close by that, you know, some cool market that you could see show from the drone shot? Then, okay, then that might change that scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've had some other properties that are actually nice 
land and they're like do you think we need drone for this and and i've actually said no because all the trees like encroach right on the house mm. and you really can't see anything but trees yeah and in that case too i'm like you know unless you just want to show off how big the lot is and maybe do like a plot outline or something like that we're not going to see a whole lot more unless there's something in the vicinity. but most a lot of times i'm actually saying no i don't think you need it you yeah. know yeah, and I think they Lake, do appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Lakefront properties are a must because you just oh, yeah. you can't get the house from the lakeside without a drone. Yeah. So, hundred percent do it for that. So, in some yeah. large homes too, you really can't get the scale of the house. Is another reason you might do drone. You're like, you know what? You're really going to get a better understanding of this scale. Just some houses, they just don't read as large as they are when you're just sitting in, on the ground in front of them with a camera. But if you get up higher, if you can see how it sprawls out behind or something like that, then you're like, yeah, it's going to show the scope of this whole place so much better. It's going to have way better, way better impact. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing you could do to sell drones, if you're just wanting to get more people interested in drones, is, you know what, if you're trying to separate uh, this listing for other, from other listings on MLS, the drone shots are different and they're eye catching. Maybe you can do a, a, a twilight drone shot or convert it to twilight too. And then you got a really cool shot that can stand out. So. Right. Yep, exactly. All right. Well, that concludes our questions from Tiffany. I think yeah, those are thanks, great Tiffany. Yeah, those thank were awesome. You. Those are I'm great. So to answer those for you guys. So, so cool. a little call to action for all y'all listeners. Mm -hmm. If you would like to DM us on Instagram at shooting the shit with Rach and Neil, we would love to hear topic ideas or send us questions your way. And we will do another episode like this when we have a handful. And we'll call you out and your Instagram handle too. So um, go follow Tiffany at Turnkey Photographic on cool. Instagram. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. And next time we get a bunch of questions, we'll be talking about your questions next time. Love yes. it. We'll see you cool, then. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> Catch you later. Bye. Bye.